Thank you. Thank you. This is land that has never and never will be ceded. That brings me on to the point of fighting racism in this country. Now, what we have to realise is we were forced by the warfare that came here in 1788 to be, to fight a battle which we're still fighting. In my opinion, we're still at war. Some of us had to go, as the early invasion happened, had to move into different tribal areas. That's different countries. That makes us the first refugees in this country. Now, we'll look, when we're looking at the refugee debate, it's got to be remembered. First Nations people are the first refugees in this country. Now, there's a lot of issues we have to confront to fight racism. One of them is to make a pact between all of our groups that have been oppressed, but there's things that are not quite right. If you look around now, First Nations activists, and I know my brother Sam Watson up there has not only fought the battle for First Nations peoples, but he fights the battle for all oppressed peoples. A lot of us do. Now, when there's snap rallies held here in Sydney, out at immigration, I'm out the front giving the talk, supporting people. But sometimes, when there's a major rally on, First Nations people are put to the side. This has got to stop. If we want to make a concerted effort against the government, the government's plan is to keep us all divided. They don't want me talking to refugees, they don't want me talking to asylum seekers, they don't want me talking to Muslim groups. I have been for many years, but they don't want it. I'll get into a little bit uh, later what a solution may be to that. But what we have to realise is that the war started in this country against our people. We have fought that war for 228 years. And the very fact that we're still here is testament to the fact that we're bloody good fighters. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. The answer to fighting oppression, racism and the war that governments place on different groups of people lies within our groups because we know the enemy so much more. I know people have been at war for many years in their own countries, but here we know how to fight the enemy. And I'm, I've always been saying, even on my ticket to stand for the Senate, I'll fight for First Nations people's rights as a first initiative, because if you smash the colonial mentality that has been keeping our people down, you, set, you, you create a freedom for all oppressed peoples. All oppressed peoples. So to smash one, one set of uh, mindset is an advantage to the whole of society. And that's quite simple. That, that's not hard logic to work out. But it appears now we're fighting racism and in recent, uh, the recent last year I've seen we pretty well uh, combined groups, loosely combined groups, have got together and the United Pe People's Front are virtually on the back pedal. You know, the last time I went to a rally there was ten of them over the road with a mongrel dog, that's about it, you know. And they just look like a motley crew. Uh, I've seen better looking park dwellers in this lot, fair deacon. And <laughs> And it was just such a joke that they even had a megaphone there. So I don't think anybody knew how to turn it on. But, um, <laughs> but the thing is, a concerted battle against them put them on the back, on the, um, back foot. And we have made inroads. But I still assert, in First Nations, racism against First Nations people, we haven't had that, made that much difference. So while we're fighting the same battle, and our activists are out in the streets fighting all battles on all fronts, you get frustrated because the racism against our people is not being addressed. There are still activists in other areas do not know how insidious and how widespread the removals of people off our lands is in this country. They still do not know the techniques that have been used by governments like turning off water and electricity and starving out communities before they move in. They still not know. But I know this because I get around to different activist groups. They still do not know that last year we overtook African Americans as two things, the highest imprisoned peoples in the world and the highest deaths in custody in the world. 
They still do not know that, as I speak now, 16,000 Aboriginal kiddies are in out-of-home care. Now, the message of racism is filtering through to certain areas. And this is, I've seen this in the past, and this is what fr frustrates me as a First Nations activist. We make these leaps and bounds, but somehow we get left to the side. And that's one thing we've got to be aware of. And I, I think it's worth pointing out, because I'm not going on the attack here, I'm saying socially it's a phenomenon that happens. But we need to be aware that it does happen. We need to be aware. Now, I'll ask a question. In, um, early this year, in a two-month period, 19 people in uh, Western Australia committed suicide, all of them under 20. Were you aware of that? Some people were. We're aware of every single asylum seeker that is dead, but we're not aware of every single Aboriginal person that's dead. This is the tragedy of this country. The media is keeping a conspiracy of silence on our issues. They're keeping it much, it's, it's much greater than any other group in the country. But we as activists and we as people who want social change have to go out and find that information. The only way you'll find it is to start following our struggles. Now it stands to reason if we're going to have what Socialist Alliance, what we've termed as a people's movement, it stands to reason we follow the people who've been fighting the battle the longest. And the, this, does, this seems a little bit all doom and gloom at the moment, but there is, there is answers. Don't, don't worry, I'm getting that. But I will reiterate that point, that um, I know one major rally that was going on a few weeks ago, and uh, there were speakers from all different groups, and there's a large group of Aboriginal people standing there who'd been to nearly every rally in this city that was against any oppressed group. And we're left standing there and nobody asked us to speak. The same group had a meeting uh, three nights ago and it was suggested I speak at a rally. It took an hour to argue the toss whether I do or not. That is not what we should be about. As we have seen in this city, Jenny Munro has done herself, our own, our own young activists, we've got young activists as young as 19 who go to rallies to support all oppressed peoples. We had young Berrigan at the age of 18 out at the Lakemba Mosque giving a talk. 18 year old Guri activist giving a talk. Where is his voice when people are having their own rallies? He should be one of the first ones they call up. He's an articulate, passionate young man. Where is his voice? We can't be, while we're, while we're fighting, we can't be swallowed up in the movement and left behind. That is the definition of colonialism. Now, if you want to fight, you've got to join in and fight with us. We are fighting that colonial mentality on behalf of everybody. On behalf of everybody. We need to have that inter-struggle inter-oppressed people's respect. Now, I was talking to a Muslim brother about two weeks ago when we had a discussion about making a pact between his group and our group, an official pact. I like the idea, but I'd like to spread it further. Let's have a pact between all, all oppressed peoples in this country, but there has to be an understanding that all oppressed peoples will gather a great understanding about our struggle, about what we're still facing today. We're not talking about 1788 here. We're talking about the highest deaths in custody rate on the planet here today. We're talking about the highest infant mortality rate outside of a war-torn land today. We're talking about, since the intervention, a 500% increase rate in the suicide of Aboriginal people today. So we're not talking some historical uh, stuff here that's come to light, we're talking about today. Now as activists we have to educate ourselves about each other's struggles. I've actually gone to the trouble to, uh, when I was deal dealing with Kurdish people, to have a look at when Kurdish people first started arriving in this country. It was in the 1970s. Which, group, which area they came from? Why did they come here? So when I was, when I was 
in a, a meeting with the Kurdish people, I knew about their struggle. But I still find when I go to our struggles, people are still asking questions. And these are seasoned activists. If you're going to be a seasoned activist, be informed. Now, I like the idea of a pact for two reasons. It'll put us under an umbrella. There are some dangers because there's some elements, and I won't say who, but some people in the room will know what I'm talking about. Some elements, I feel, can cause more, more damage than good. When you find those elements within your group, you tend to ostracise them which is a good thing, but good, good, hard-working, honest people to get the grassroots activists to make pacts between each other. Forget these alleged appointed leaders. It's grassroots people to sit together, start talking, start negotiating. Um, we don't want to make a pact with the enemy, the government. The government's trying to kill us all off. Um, we want to make a pact amongst each other that we will fight the enemy. First and foremost, Acknowledge who were the first people at war in this country, the First Nations people. Who were the first refugees in this country, the First Nations people. Who have been fighting the fight the longest, the First Nations people. Then we start acknowledging each other and respecting each other's point of view of why we're being oppressed and why we're being attacked. And we'll find out it's all about, the, we've got the commonalities, the colonial mentality and the capitalist bodies being behind the whole lot for the... <laughs> we know that, yet we're still being fragmented. We're still fighting here, there. Now, the groups who leave Indigenous peoples on the sidelines standing in a, in a park without a, without a voice, they're playing into the government's hands because that's what the government wants. They want that group to uh, talk with their own speakers. They don't want a diversity of speakers up there. That's what they want. And that is ridiculous. So if we start recognising between each other and having need to respect between each other and start saying, we will support you 100% of the way and do this under the media gaze and release it to the government. I'll tell you what, if I was Malcolm Turnbull and I read a pact between a dozen different groups that are being oppressed between these people, I'd start to think, wait a sec, they're not being fooled anymore. Something went wrong. <laughs> I'd be a little bit worried. I'd be a little bit worried that people are becoming more sophisticated in their mobilisation in the fight against colonialism, racism and oppression in this country. And we have to realise we've been doing it well. Look, we're 2.7% of the population, but again, we're still here. What does that tell every group in this room? We know what we're doing. So instead of leaving us on the sideline, bring us to the forefront. Bring us to the forefront because once we start doing this, and especially if the government sees that we're all going under the same banner and the first people attacked are the peoples leading this charge against the hatred that the government is spewing out against all groups, that's when they'll go on the back foot. At the moment, they're putting us all on the back foot. We're all on the defensive because we're all here, here, here and here. Let's all get there and put them on the back foot. My politics is about putting governments on the back foot. And that is the only way I can sensibly think now to do it. Thank you.